Hi everyone, and welcome to our little YouTube channel. I am Francesca Barbini, the owner of Luna Press Publishing, and today I am here with our author, Puja Mittal Biswas. And we are about to have a little mini launch for Puja's latest book, which is coming out on the 25th of May. A Diasporic Mythography, Myth, Legend and Memory in the Literature of the Indian Diaspora. Puja, it's always a pleasure to see you. We were here last time for the launch of Gender in Time and Time in Gender. So how have yep. you been? I've, I've been well, um, and I've been looking forward to uh, a diaspora mythography coming out. Yeah. Excellent. Oh, I know it, it's, it's very exciting, actually. So let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about the book itself. Can you tell us uh, exactly um, why this topic? How did you choose this topic? Well, it, it was kind of a natural, um, a, a natural choice of topic for me because uh, I myself am a diasporic Indian, and um, I grew up largely outside of India. Um, so I was born and raised in Nigeria um, for many, many years. I, I did keep traveling back to India every year, but I was technically I was born, born and raised outside. And um, the Indian community outside of uh, you know India um, often you know used and still uses. Uh, myth and legend to reconnect with India. So um, one of the ways that, you know, I sort of identified as Indian, uh, despite not physically being raised in India, is that I was raised in, um, you know, a very large Indian expatriate community in Nigeria. We had our own school, uh, Indian language school, which had like 800 or 1,000 students. So it was a big community. Yeah. And, um, and so we basically, um, you know, our Indianness, you know, for, for, for us children who were, who were born outside, was kind of drawn from the stories we were told about the Mahabharata, you know, um, you know, uh, the Bhagavad Gita, the Ramayana, and all our sort of um, tales uh, and legends, um, uh, like the Panchatantra, which is sort of, um, um, you know, mythical stories about animals, kind of like an Indian version of Aesop's fables. And um, so, yes, and uh, my family, which was a Hindi family, obviously celebrated all the different festivals, Diwali, Holi, all of them. Um, so for me, myths and legends were actually always a really, really important part of my personality and of my, um, of my identity as, as an Indian. And, um, and that continued to be the case no matter where I moved in the world, into you know, New Zealand, and now I'm in Australia, have been for a long time now. Um, so, you know, I'd always wanted to, so, and I'd, I'd noticed that this was a common theme in diasporic authors' work as well, diasporic Indian authors, um, uh, like Salman Rushdie, Shashi Tharoor, Suniti Nam Joshi and Bikram Chandra, who I study uh, in this book, as well as a whole bunch of other authors. But um, so it was, it was basically my drive to see, you know, how exactly does it work and why, you know, I mean, um, you know, uh, why myths and legends are used by diasporic Indian authors, um, how do they reconnect with India um, using these stories, and um, how do they incorporate them into diasporic narratives? Um, and that was very important to me. And so that it's not it's so I just sort of naturally ended up researching this basically. So, so at the moment, you know, when you think about yourself, uh, do you feel uh, what nationality do you feel more? Akin to. If, if actually, yeah, I'd probably say I'm an earthling. <laughs> I've been all <laughs> yes, over the world. I don't know. I <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but yes, I'm. I'm very much uh, an Indian, but I'm also. I, I also feel you know part Nigerian because I did. You know, I was born in raised there, so I did grow up there. Um, but I also grew up in New Zealand, <clears throat> and also partly in Australia. So I, I do sort of you know the the real. Um, you know, uh, tense moments come when there's, for example, like a football match <laughs> between like, Nigeria and Australia, and I'm just like, <laughs> yeah. both, both, but both, yes. <laughs> so um, that's that's you know, so my loyalties are tested sometimes, but it's sort of it, it is kind of identified with all of these places. But yes, my Indianness, my being Indian, ties them all together. So it's sort of that. Very good. Yeah. Yes. I suppose I was, I was actually thinking about it when I was reading uh, your manuscript, you know, for the first time, because uh, I am, of course, from Italy and yeah. uh, I have now lived uh, exactly half of my life in Italy uh, from mm -hmm. birth and half of my life in Scotland. So yeah. 
it's interesting because um, obviously Scotland isn't England or Britain at large. Scotland is very much Scotland, and so yeah. um, I think uh, I, I think primarily I will always feel Italian. So, like you said, there's my Italianness mm -hmm. that, that gathers things together. But of course, yeah. uh, you know, over two decades of life in Scotland uh, have certainly um, adjusted certain uh, <laughs> ways of life, you know, for yeah. me uh, and ways of thinking. So. Um, but there, this also actually leads me to another point. It was something that, again, I was reading uh, in the introduction of your book, which uh, I found fascinating. And you can tell us a little bit more about that as well. It was the way that uh, the way that an author of the diaspora writes and uh, mm -hmm. and uh, interprets culture and and what it creates. For example, if I had never left Italy, I think my mm -hmm. my, my writing would have been informed by full-blown Italianness. So of course you do get um, you know inspired by the writing you read from all over the world but primarily mm -hmm. I think my building block would have been that uh, my my filters for seeing fiction would have been yeah. through yeah. I guess, Italian filters right um, mm -hmm. however if you then move to another country especially after you know 20 years etc then suddenly uh, I was finding that I wasn't necessarily writing through a Scottish lens, but I had created mm. almost like a third uh, scenario in, in which Italianness and Scottishness combined uh, created a new output. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, actually, that's exactly what, um, uh, that's one of the things I, I, I talk about in the book uh, when I talk about um, the third space. Um, so there's a post-colonial um, scholar, scholar called Homi Papa. Um, so B-H-A-B-H-A, uh, -H -A -B -H -A, last name for those who are listening and might want to look it up. Um, so um, he talks about um, the third space as being this, you know, very productive and fruitful place to be, um, you know, and it's it's when, you know, two cultures sort of, you know, um, you know, interact and that's sort of the middle space, kind of like a Venn diagram that's overlapping. So like kind of the middle space is where a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot of potential for creativity. And um, I mean, as, as someone who is a diasporic author myself, I, I often feel as though all the places I have been to, um, even if I hadn't stayed um, too long in each one of them, um, but, um, you know, they sort of flavor my writing like spices, you know, and you can kind of tell it's there, just like you can tell, you know, oh, that's a hint of cinnamon or that's a hint of, you know, um, <laughs> you know, pepper or something. So you can tell. Um, but definitely, I think that third space is 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 very fruitful, and I, all the authors um, I've uh, ever encountered who are diasporic do, to some degree, operate from within that space, um, because that's just part of it. Like you know, when you come from a particular country and you go to another one, um, you know, sort of the journey is kind of that in between state. And even if our feet physically land on the new place. Yeah. Um, but a part of us is always going to feel like we're on a journey, like we haven't arrived. Because if you're not back in the homeland, it always feels kind of like you're still moving, you're still journeying. And so you kind of always inhabit that in-between space. Um, and um, it doesn't mean that you don't identify with the new country and the new culture, but there's a part of you that also identifies with something else. And that is where that kind of that third um space comes and i think the question is um you know uh, are we sort of confused by that or are we sort of um more focused uh because of that and um you know a lot of the authors i do study in the book um i would say are actually more focused as a result and um they have um there's a there's a concept i mentioned in the book um called uh the myth of the origin and uh, it's uh, it's uh, Jacques Derrida, um, the the French uh, scholar, and um, he he sort of came up with that term of the myth of the origin, and you know, in the sense that the origin is never entirely real, and yet a lot of people keep seeking for it. And I kind of took that out of <laughs> that context, and I sort of you know, in, in I put it in a diasporic context, and I said that well, you know, all of us who are diasporic authors, um, you know, or even even if we're non authors, just anyone who's diasporic. There's, there's a part of us, you know, that hangs on to the myth of the origin. And it can be really interesting because sometimes uh, that myth can differ from what the origin is like presently. So, um, so for example, um, I'll just, I'll give you an example from my, my own life. So uh, obviously Indian, um, while I was living in New Zealand for a long time, I was a New Zealand citizen and everything. And again, grew up there, I think, in the ages of 
12 to 17. Um, so um, I remember when I sort of uh, met the Fiji Indian community, beautiful community. And, um, and I actually felt, to my surprise, that I felt like they were more Indian than, <laughs> like, I mean, in terms of some of the um, <laughs> cultural practices they were doing uh, compared to, because I just come from, like, I was, because I used to go and, and live in India every year for about two to three months, uh, almost every single year. And I felt like they were actually more faithful in observing some of the, um, some of the, you know, sort of specific cultural or religious sort of um, rituals and, 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 and festivals and all that. And, um, and, you know, so I, I kind of thought, you know, that's kind of like, you know, cause that was what it was like when they left India and, and they've kind of maintained that. And I found that really, really fascinating. And, um, you know, so it's it's very much that seeking for the origin that is there in a lot of diasporic work. Yeah, you know, I am thinking now that you've said that this is uh, is quite scary and fascinating because uh, the Italy that I, although I do go back to Italy, of course, you know, every year, etc., and I do mm -hmm. the news and all of that. But my Italian experience is very specific, isn't it? It, it, yeah. it is the experience of a child and a teenager and a young adult of 20 mm. years ago when it comes to living there and, and and if you think about it that perhaps is also an age where say you're not in charge of a household or bills or things like that so it's a very a limited experience you know in a sense mm. so sometimes I'm thinking you know would I actually be able to to produce uh, you know Italian uh, writing in Italian uh, that reflect accurately what Italy is today because of that so that's exactly what you were saying you know in a sense I think I've taken with me things that perhaps uh, you know don't apply anymore or maybe they might be skin as old yeah. fashioned <laughs> Become uh, walking, talking time capsule. You know, yeah, of <laughs> like you know, of wherever we live. I left. love that a walking, talking <laughs> time capsule. Yes, absolutely. That that's that's true. That's true. And and another thought I had when you were talking before. Okay, and uh, I don't know if you if you want to if you have something um, on this. Uh, uh, you know, as you know, today we talk a lot about uh, cultural appropriation when it comes oh, yeah. to writing. Right, so. Um, and I was thinking, you know, uh, a person who, say, for example, you know, you're coming from a different culture, a different background, but then mm. you spend half of your life in a different setting and suddenly you have this third <laughs> state yeah. in which you're in. Um, where do we draw the line in your yeah. opinion with uh, how much an author is allowed to explore this new reality, which isn't uh, necessarily one or two it's the yeah. middle stage the middle yeah this um i actually um i i actually uh recently uh taught a course on researching and writing diversity here um uh, for writing nsw so new south wales basically that's uh, the state of, of australia where i am at the moment um and one of the main sections of that course uh was actually on cultural appropriation and how to avoid it but it's true, it's it's much trickier uh, in that third space to kind of, you know, um, come up with, you know, clean sort of, um, you know, lines of division. And I'm not sure they should be, actually, when it comes to what it means to be human, uh, especially for those of us that are diasporic. I think the main thing is to remember um, kind of the space we occupy and to acknowledge and, and not to sort of um, exaggerate or let it consume other things. So, for example... Um, you know, um, you know, for me, I, I often feel sometimes it's like a reverse culture thing. Like you said, you know, like, um, and this is what a lot of diasporic authors also get told is like, do you still have the right to, you know, talk about, you know, India or talk about Italy, you know, when you, you know, when you left ages ago. And, and um, so I often, you know, run into that myself. And for example, um, you know, um, do I feel like I would, you know, for example, if I wanted to write about what is known as the Harijan or the so-called untouchables caste, which I, is obviously a very problematic term and I don't like it. I'm just using it so that people yeah. can identify what I'm talking about. Um, uh, and I, I don't, I, I, you know, I don't have that experience. So a part of me feels like I don't have the right to talk about it. Um, uh, there's also a, um, a scholar called uh, Gayatri Ch uh, Chakraborty Spivak, um, who wrote a very fascinating uh, paper called Can the Subaltern Speak? And the subaltern, you know, basically those, those that are, you know, very oppressed. And is it actually possible for the voiceless to have a voice, basically, when the 
voice has been taken from them. And I think as long as an, like a diasporic author, those of us that are coming from that in-between stage, where at least we have some lived-in experience, you know, at least we've been there for some time. I think it's important to be aware of the dynamics that exist between our home cultures and kind of the target cultures. So, for example, if I came from a colonizing power initially and I settled in a colonized country and I became familiar with the cultures, you know, and, and, and the you know traditions and all that of, of the colonized country, maybe I even became very intimate with it. Maybe I even sort of married and had a family there or whatever, you know. Um, but a part of me would still be coming from kind of the oppressor's uh, or occupier's perspective. And a lot of people who live locally might think that about me and probably be correct about it to a degree. So theoretically, if this, if this scenario existed and if I you know, was to do that, it's not that I, I wouldn't have the right to talk about it. I could definitely talk about my diasporic experience. Yeah. But what I would hesitate to do would be kind of too appropriate to take over the voice of someone who was born and raised there and actually was from um, that particular culture from the start. Um, and um, so I would have to be careful to sort of avoid doing that. Like that would be my personal choice as an author that, um, you know, because that might turn into appropriation, um, you know, uh, as opposed to appreciation and sort of, you know, um, absorbing it into one's own narrative. So if I was to write about it as my diasporic narrative, that would be absolutely fine. Yes. Um, but I, I would try to avoid um, actually to kind of, to kind of try, trying to take possession of um, or, you know, take the right of being able to speak from the space of someone who was, you know, who, whose family and whose history is actually based in, yes. in that cultural life. It makes sense, <laughs> it makes sense because uh, you and uh, nobody would be able to ever deny that you are someone on a journey from yeah. one culture to another. So if that was your character, there would be absolutely no problem with that because people wouldn't understand, for example, that journey exactly. and, and they would see it through the eyes of the character. So actually that, in a sense, is quite, it's also enlightening, I guess, because it, it shows you, mm. you know, uh, it shows you what perhaps thought process go through the mind of someone who shifts from one culture to the other, um, not necessarily abandoning the first or you know, but but it's a transition, isn't it? And uh, and the way that the two amalgam, I think I think that is actually very interesting, uh, more than perhaps trying to guess how the new culture would act or react in that sense yes i i absolutely agree i absolutely agree so that's good that's good i like that um you already mentioned actually some of the names uh, um of the people that you explore in your book uh, and uh, some of these names are also familiar to some so and we are going to be talking about them uh, specifically but uh, the works uh, in this book are from uh, uh, salman rashti um, Shashi Tarur, Suniti Namjoshi, and uh, Vikram Chandra. So, would you like to tell us a little bit more about these authors, please? Yeah, I'd, I'd love to. Um, so, um, I started with Salman Rushdie because, you know, most people have heard about him, um, even people who aren't particularly into necessary, uh, necessarily in tune literature, but they've probably heard about him. They've probably heard about the fatwa that was issued against him, um, you know, and because he's he's occupied the media um, quite a bit um, compared to some of the other the, the other authors. Although Shashi Thirud obviously has also been present, but um, so someone actually has, I started off with, um, and um, he's fascinating because he's written a lot, um, even in his own like um, uh, not just in the form of stories, but you know, in in terms of autobiograph autobiographical essays, okay. he's actually written a lot about being a diasporic Indian and. Um, and he has some, you know, really sort of uh, wonderful images, which is what you'd expect of Rushdie, really. But he's got some wonderful images that kind of describe from, you know, a subjective sort of a subjective experience uh, of, of being diasporic. And, you know, um, and he often talks about um, sort of, you know, the broken mirror, uh, you know, as, you know, so, so for example, you know, obviously, if you break a mirror, you've got plenty of reflections looking back at you, not just yeah. one. <laughs> and and so uh, I found that a very evocative image for the diasporic experience. Um, 
But he also says that, you know, sometimes the broken mirror can be sometimes uh, as or more useful than the whole one because you can see things that you wouldn't otherwise be able to see or perspectives or angles that you can't see. So that is something I found very inspiring. Um, and um, his essay, um, Imaginary Homelands, is, is just wonderful and it's absolutely um, very enlightening. I, I would suggest anyone who's sort of um, interested in the diasporic experience, doesn't matter where you're coming from or where you're going, <laughs> but if you're interested in, in, in the diasporic experience, that would be, uh, you know, um, uh, an essay to read. In fact, there's a book um, by that title of his as well, Imaginary Homelands, um, which sort of expands further on this theme. Um, so yes, and I, I focused um, uh, on his novel, Midnight's Children, here. Um, because I found that um, it reflected that sort of, you know, the broken mirror aspect really, really well. Now, the novel itself is actually based um, in India um, and it follows um, sort of the, the children who were born on the hour of India's independence. So midnight's children. So, you know, um, you know, those that were born particularly at that you know, at that day, at the stroke of midnight. And um, in this novel, they all have uh, kind of uh, unusual or special powers or abilities, um, something that makes them different. And uh, Salim, who's the main character of uh, of Midnight's Children, is no different. But it's, it's, it's kind of, you know, it's, um, it's, it's kind of a tragic tale in the sense that um, Salim physically disintegrates, which is <laughs> people, people probably going to wonder what uh, when I say that, but he physically disintegrates as India disintegrates. So it's like he shares the fate of India. He was born at the same time. And, you know, so, you know, the novel explores the deep generational trauma that was instigated by the partition of India yep. on both sides, you know, uh, for, for both Hindus and Muslims, um, you know, regardless of which side of the border the families are on now, you know, whether they're on the Pakistani side of the border, the Indian side, it was a traumatic experience, um, you know, for, uh, you know, for everyone involved. And, um, and he sort of explores that and, you know, that sense of, you know, the kind of um, almost, you would say the body horror of, <laughs> of um, you know, Selene disintegrating is, is, you know, sort of reflects that. And yet, I found in that narrative of disintegration um, aspects of that, you know, that same broken mirror kind of um, uh, image of, of Rajdi's and, um, you know, and, and sort of, I felt as though, I mean, of course he might disagree with me, but um, I, I, I felt as though there were aspects of the diasporic experience that were in there. And in fact, I believe he said that in Imaginary Homelands. And I think he, he talked about, um, you know, creating Indias of the mind. And he wanted to bring it all back in, um, he said, you know, uh, quote, unquote, glorious Technicolor, you know, like the, the Hindi movies, that the old Bollywood Hindi movies and the Technicolor, you know, and he wanted to kind of bring it back to that vibrant. And so that longing, that diasporic longing is present in his um, in his kind of characterization of India, if you could call it, and in, in his descriptions of India. So um, that's that's him. So that's why I, I, I chose him. Um, then um, Shashi Thur, obviously, um, also, a, you know, a, a great Indian diasporic author um, who has been all over the world. And um, I chose his book, The Great Indian Novel, because it has the, um, uh, it's, it, um, obviously, it calls itself The Great Indian Novel, which in itself tells you something about its ambitions and its scope. But what I found fascinating was that it was actually narrated uh, by Ganesh. Um, so he's kind of the, the god, you know, the, the scribe. Um, and um, and I, I found that really, really interesting how sort of, you know, uh, mythology and history are kind of intertwined in the novel. And um, I have found that, you know, in diasporic literature, kind of that myth of the origin kind of blends with the realities of wherever you happen to be living. And so that blending is very much a diasporic thing as well you know, the way that is done. So from a textual point of view, I felt like that was uh, a very diasporic approach to take. And um, and then, of course, uh, actually, I should probably tell this little thing for people who don't, <laughs> who are not familiar with Ganesh, the elephant-headed god, but he himself is quite a diasporic figure. Um, and, um, you know, and uh, what's, um, there's, a, there's a funny anecdote um, of when he was very young and he and his brother Kartike, who was a human-headed, God. Um, and he wrote a peacock, Kartike, and Ganesh just wrote a mouse, okay, a little mouse. 
Um, uh, and um, so, you know, uh, in order to sort of, you know, that their parents um, told them, like, you know, uh, Shiva told them to sort of, you know, um, you know, to sort of compete going around the world, you know. And um, so, you know, the other brother, Kartike, he immediately got on his peacock and he zoomed around the world. But uh, uh, Ganesh actually finished the challenge first because he just took, you know, a circle around his parents. And he said, well, you are my world. So oh, I've been around wow. the world. And obviously he won, because who wouldn't? <laughs> like, you know, with that slick book anyway. But um, but I found that really, really very quite interesting. And, um, you know, uh, kind of, yeah, I've always found Ganesh interesting that way. Um, as, as someone who kind of um, subverts the idea of what it means to journey and what it means to go someplace. And that you could technically journey where you are if you're willing to look at it in a new way. So if you're willing to see the world in a grain of sand, then the grain of sand can show you the world. It's pre pretty much, you know, and so I found that very interesting. But so Shishitharu definitely sort of brings, you know, sort of the myths and legends and the voices, you know, um, of uh, mythical characters in, you know, in you know, blends them in with India's actual history, uh, which is uh, really, really fascinating. And the other two uh, novelists uh, that I chose, oh, well, Suniki Nam Joshi isn't just a, novel, just a novelist, my goodness. She's also a, uh, she's also a poet. And um, so she has the sort of, um, you know, uh, the remarkable identifying feature of um, being the first openly lesbian author in India, which is a big thing. And, um, you know, I mean, and it makes sense why there haven't been too many open authors because, um, uh, homosexuality was only decriminalized in India in 2018, so just two years ago. So, um, which is, of course, is terrible. I think it should have always been legal everywhere, but um, but that wasn't the case. And that was actually one of her motivations for leaving India is is the fact that her family, you know, um, you know, kind of unofficially, informally, you know, disowned her essentially and made her feel like she didn't belong. So she left. Um, and um, and she produced a lot of amazing work after she left. Um, uh, you know, I, I cover a whole bunch of her work actually in yep. in the chapter that's dedicated to her. So, you know, I I look at some of her poetry, I look at some of her prose um, because she does such interesting conceptual things. Um, like one of the most interesting ones uh, that I look at is actually. Um, from a book of poetry called Flesh and Paper that she co-wrote with her partner, Julian Hanscom. And in that, one of the things they do is they revision The Tempest, Shakespeare's The Tempest, and they make Caliban a lesbian, <laughs> a lesbian woman, and Miranda, um, her, her lover, and Prospero kind of the, um, and obviously Caliban is a post-colonial figure, so he's not white, <laughs> uh, or she's not white in this case, um, and Prospero is sort of categorised as kind of, you know, the old white colonial patriarch kind of thing, and, but also, he's also quite humanised though, I and mean, he's, he's portrayed as being quite, quite befuddled by, um, you know, what his, you know, by his daughter and <laughs> Calvin, you know, he's like, what is going on? Um, but it was, it, it's a really good um, story because it sort of explores that intersection of queer theory and post-colonial studies, which I find really, really interesting. And it also, to my, to my mind, kind of looks into, um, you know, the diversity of the Indian diaspora and that there's a large number of LGBTQ um, people in the Indian diaspora. So I, I felt that was an important sort of, um, uh, you know, factor to sort of explore. Um, I also look into some of the fictional worlds she creates, like, for example, in uh, The Mothers of Maya D, which is, um, you know, she, she creates sort of matriarchal society and it's, it's, it's run by women, but it's still a dystopia. And, you know, and so basically she, she analyzes how, you know, injustice uh, is perpetuated by you know, the sort of the institutionalization of any kind of power, um, you know, and the hanging on to power by anyone, it doesn't matter where they come from or what they do, but that in itself is damaging. And, um, and that that binary system of always thinking that, you know, things come in twos and that one is always better than the other, but that's very damaging. So for example, male, female, usually the male is privileged above the female in contemporary society and for most of history. And so even when she flips that script, as long as that binary dichotomy exists, there's always going to be one privileged above the other. So she kind of looks into how that can be damaging. 
and it kind of also you know um you know makes you think about deconstructing binaries um yeah. and one of the binaries to deconstruct would be the kind of the diasporic slash native binary you know that are you you know are you a, you know are you a journeyer are you a traveler or have you always lived there and you know and that it's more more of an illusion than we think that binary yeah. um and it's an illusion because um you know i mean you know a lot of for example in india a lot of people came from all over the world uh, india is made up of communities that so you filtered in you know um uh you know there's indians whose ancestors came from africa whose ancestors came you know um from europe you know who came from pretty much everywhere and they've settled all over india so um it is in a, in a way a diasporic nation it's uh you know it's it's it and that's why it's so rich in all these different cultures and religions and ways of dressing and eating and all that good stuff especially the eating um <laughs> and uh so yes yeah, so that was suniti nam joshi and then finally i focus on a younger author because i kind of wanted to have a more kind of forward facing um, sure. author um as well so he's kind of the next generation um of you know to to rashdi um and uh, i look at his uh book red earth and pouring rain which is wonderfully uh, irreverent and playful uh, that novel and it's it sort of explores um rebirth and um and how stories can kind of be reborn again which i find very much a uh, diasporic thing as well like you know we go through rebirths as well <laughs> you know multiple rebirths and yep. um and um and the characters in um chandra's book do do that so you know there's a dias- young man um diasporic indian who comes back to india to visit his family visit his parents and uh one thing leads to another and he ends up trapped in a monkey's body <laughs> <laughs> which you know as it, as it happens and um and uh but he becomes quite a sensation because he's he's this great kind of storyteller and he starts telling stories on a typewriter and then the whole you know his fame spreads and you know the villagers come and then the press comes and it's like this big thing and uh it's 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 quite funny um but he sort of it it also explores the soul of um a poet uh, called Sanjay Parasha who sort of has lived through various lives and various eras and it kind of you know follows those lives um so it's quite it's quite an epic book but it's very very humorous as well um and um and and very clever and so that was kind of you know that concept of like i said of of you know being reborn and again and again and you know identity reforming and identity is being something that's always in formation you know not something that you know it's like a you know brick like it's just formed and it just sits there but rather it's something organic and evolving and that's a uh, very much a diasporic experience so that's why i chose him but anyway those are the authors fantastic oh, no, there there's going to be a, a lot of uh, uh, i can imagine this uh, to be read pile of books uh, keep keep growing and growing and growing you know uh whenever whenever we do something uh, for our non fiction you know with luna press uh, um mm-hmm. i always get emails from people saying you know you guys your reference lists are huge they just make my tbr piles go over and over <laughs> <laughs> but but honestly no it, it is actually it's been a fascinating journey um for me especially of exploration because uh, you know they might have been author the I, I wasn't aware of or I wasn't aware to the extent, uh, you know, for example, the, their impact, mm. on, uh, you know, on not just the, on India, but on authors of uh, the diaspora. So this has yeah. been really, really exciting for me. And here we are. So the 25th of May, the book is going to be uh, on, available uh, online uh, through our website, but of course, through your usual sales channel. and uh, you can get it in paperback and of course uh, in ebook so this is uh, this has been a fascinating uh, uh, journey once again and uh, it is always a pleasure puja to talk to you about your work uh, because you really do so many you know you, you tackle so many interesting topic uh, um also topics which are very actual very you know very important and relevant uh, for for today and uh, for many authors as well when it comes to approaching perhaps this topic you know this topics i think i think uh, they would find uh, your book uh, extremely useful in their journey as writers and uh, 
the you. bottom lighter in your journey as a human being, right? Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. That's, that's a uh, idea. It's, it's been fantastic. <laughs> so. I would like to thank you all for following us and for being with us, uh, with me and Pooja today uh, for this uh, little book launch, because, of course, uh, we are in two different continents. Uh, so <laughs> we, <laughs> we have to, no, we make do, we make do with technology. And that's yeah, that's perfect. why it's night over here at the moment and, and day where you are, but yeah. <laughs> yes, and, and that's perfectly good. So <laughs> the theme we're talking about, yeah. <laughs> That's for like different countries, yeah. Completely. Um, but uh, listen, so thank you, thank you so much. And we shall uh, catch up soon for your yeah. next project then. Okay. Thank, thank you, you so much for being with us, Pooja. Thank you. And thanks everyone as well for listening.